Well, good evening. It's good to see everybody this uh, cool fall day. And for those of you that are missing the warm weather, I'm, I'm sure Brother Kyle is really excited about the weather we have today. So anyway, if you stand and sing, we're going to sing uh, a, a song, My Sins Are Gone. This is the song that's all about the t-shirts that Brother Kyle has been talking about. I'm happy. Ask me why. So My Sins Are Gone. <laughs> that our sins are gone. So if the usher prepared for the offering, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for your blessing to us. Thanks for the rain you've sent our way and the protection on the roads to get here tonight uh, to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we're especially thankful uh, that our sins are gone because of what Christ did for us on the cross and his blood that was shed. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us as we have each part of these services tonight, continuing the song service, uh, the offering for your honor and your glory. And we especially pray for your uh, speaking through uh, Brother Kyle as he speaks to us tonight in your word. Uh, Lord, just open our hearts to those things that we need to hear. And that he too, that would be honoring and glorifying you in all things we say and do. Lord, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> as we sing Every Day with Jesus.
There on the mountain top, there in every day in the mundane, there in the sorrow and the dancing, your great grace, oh such grace. From the creation to the cross. There from the cross into eternity, your grace finds me. Yes, your grace finds me. It's there on the wedding day, and there in the weeping by the graveside. There in the very breath we breathe, your great grace. The same for the rich and poor. The same for the saint and for the sinner. And up for this whole wide world, your great grace, oh such grace. There to creation to the cross. There from the cross into eternity, your grace finds me. Yes, your grace finds me. There in the darkest night of the soul. There in the sweetest songs of victory, your grace finds me. Yes, your grace finds me. Your great grace, oh, such grace. Your great grace, oh, such grace. So I'm breathing in your grace, I'm breathing out your praise, I'm breathing in your grace, forever I'll be breathing in your grace, I'm breathing out your praise, I'm breathing in your grace, forever I'll be breathing in your grace, I'm breathing out your praise. Breathing in your grace Forever, God, forever Your grace finds me Yes, your grace finds me Amen it's good to see y'all here. I want to make something clear. Brother Robert was right about the temperature. I just don't like the rain and the cold. Picky. Now, I, uh, I definitely would rather it be cold uh, and rainy than hot and rainy. That's just me. If you have your Bibles, you turn over to uh, 1 Thessalonians, if you will. And we're going to just pick right up. Uh, 
I want to tell everybody thank you for your participation in our uh, first Everyone Bring One service. If you had a guest here on Sunday, uh, I hope that they uh, were blessed. I know we were blessed by them being here, and uh, hopefully we'll see them come back again. Um, and uh, if you weren't able to get somebody to come, I know that we were, I was talking to a few people, and I know for us even we had invited uh, different people, and um, they backed out kind of one by one, uh, except for one surprise Sunday morning. I had one of the people that I had uh, invited actually showed up. Uh, I got a text Sunday morning asking about it, so uh, praise the Lord for that. So uh, again, thank you for your participation in that. And uh, don't forget, uh, tomorrow we have outreach um, as normal, uh, back on schedule for that, and uh, back on schedule for our normal services. So, Well, last sermon that we were in this study, uh, we, we saw a couple things um, that were um, very important. I just want to review that before we get into tonight's. Uh, we talked about how it's important to draw near to God, to his body. Uh, whenever you're going through uh, something difficult, you're, being, uh, you're discouraged. Uh, we talked about how we need to make sure we experience the help of God through our humility. And I said a couple things that I think I want to remind us of, and it's this. If you're discouraged, don't skip worship services. If you're discouraged, don't slack in your serving. If you're discouraged, don't quit. And don't give up because we talked about how it's easy uh, to do that. We talked about how the fleshly thing is usually the easiest thing to do. The spiritual thing is usually the harder thing to do. And so when you feel discouraged, you feel down, and you feel like, I'm just going to skip, I'm just going to back out, I'm just going to pull away, don't give in to that. Don't, don't do that because that's exactly where Satan wants to take you down a road of, of uh, destruction uh, through, through all of that. So... Uh, I encourage us to press into the Lord, to press into the family that he's given us in him. And we saw point one was we're to make conscious efforts to encourage the discouraged. So that was the response of the people who are discouraged. For those of us who are not discouraged, we are to make every effort and a conscious effort to encourage those. We're to be an example in also our steadfastness when we go through uh, difficulties in this life. We're feeling a week, we're going through something difficult, we should remain steadfast and be that example of what it looks like uh, to do that. We have to remember that we're in this Christian life, we're in this fight together. This is not something we're to be doing alone. Um, I, I talked about how uh, Spurgeon said uh, that we are a family, that we are uh, called sheep, and sheep go in flocks. We're not individuals, and we're not supposed to walk this path in the Christian life, uh, again, alone. We're supposed to be doing this together. But we know that we're going to go through weak times. We're going to face weak, um, uh, weakness in our flesh. And so those of us who are maybe strong, maybe you're here and you're saying, I, I feel like I'm not weak. I feel like I'm strong uh, in, in my life right now. We are to make conscious efforts to support the weak. In that, we saw that we are supposed to be patient with each other. And um, this is something that can be a bit of a difficulty for us, patience. Um, I, I have noticed something about myself and, and my lovely wife has pointed it out uh, to me as well. And this is, as I get older, I feel like my patience when I get in the car grows less and less. And that's just the way. I guess some people, uh, when they get older, they have more patience. Um, when, but <laughs> when, when they're driving, but... Uh, Maybe most people don't, but I, I, I am definitely struggling in that area. Um, you know, when, and I've shared this before, when people have that, they put a big old stick on the side of your steering wheel. That in, in old times, there were two. One, to change the gears, and the other, to let people know what you're going to do, where you're going to go. And they amazingly have left that left stick on the steering wheel, right up there where it's handy, next to your hand. It's not... Hard. Most of the time, you can, you can even grab it with your, your hand without leaving the steering wheel. You can hit that stick over there. And uh, they moved the other one. You know, most of them now are down here. Mine's still up here. But um, they have those on there for a major reason. It's a safety reason as well. And it's just uh, beginning to draw out the impatience, I guess, the weakness in my flesh. <laughs> in that area, the older I get. And then also, sometimes people just um, randomly ride their brakes, right? They just, 
They drive with their foot on the brake, I guess. I, I don't know. And, and it just prompts questions in my brain. And sometimes they come out like, what are you doing? Why are you stopping? Why are we stopping? Why are we stopping? Just wondering, asking the question. Not that they can hear me, but uh, it's just one of those things. But patience is vital with each other, but it's also a charge that we have in the Scripture. The, uh, the Lord knew the struggles that we would have, and of course, over and over and over in Scripture in the New Testament, we see the need for us to be patient. And so we, challenged, uh, we were challenged with that question. The next time that your patience with another person, especially another brother or sister, uh, is, is challenged or uh, tested, to ask yourself the question, how patient is God with me? And it's hard to do that, you know, when you're on the road and you can't have a conversation with a person of reason, but it's still a good reminder, how patient is God with me? And not only that, how, how many times have I deserved to be given up on? How many times did I deserve for God to give up on me? And, and other questions like that, how long suffering has God been with me? And so the third thing was this, that we are to make conscious efforts to be patient with all men. And so we move forward this week uh, after those charges, and we see a couple other uh, responsibilities that we have as Christians. And so I want to look at those, and, and, we'll, and we'll go forward. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to be here again. And thank you for uh, the music and the time that we've had to worship you through that and also worship you through giving. And I ask that now you would just use me as a vessel uh, to speak to us tonight and that we would receive what you have in your word. And, and God, we would take it with us and not only apply it in our lives, uh, but even maybe share it with others. And so God, um, just move now. I pray your spirit would have full reign and that we would be open to uh, whatever you want to do in our lives. And we'll praise you for it all, God. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, verse 15 is where we pick up, and here it goes. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Now I see my two little girls down here on the front row, and they know that this scripture has been used in our house, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, whenever there have been sister spats, you know, and and, you know, what happens is uh, we hear something going on, and, and so we say, hey, what's going on? And one of them says, so-and-so did this to me. And so the other's response is, most of the time, that's because she did this to me. <laughs> and so uh, we, we have this discussion, and we read the Scripture at night and, and pray, and, and sometimes we remind them that the Bible says that we are not to render evil for evil. The word render means to repay. Render equals repay. So when it says no one is supposed to repay evil for evil to any man is very important. But this verse has a negative charge and it has a positive charge in it. What that means is this. The negative is it tells us not to do something. The positive is it tells us to do something. The charge before, again, we just were reminded of was to be patient with all men. So right before he says, don't repay anybody for evil, he tells, he tells us that we're to be patient with all men. We know the opposite of patience, of course, is impatience. In other words, we could use something like short-fused or short-tempered, or we could even say the product of impatience or having a short fuse is a reaction. And the reaction typically is a reaction in emotion. And that is where we begin to mess up really bad. Is when we have a short fuse or we are impatient and we respond, whether it's with our attitude, our actions, or our speech, in emotion, most of the time it's seen as retaliation. Uh, because something has been done to us or something has not been done to us. And so we react in our impatience and we react in that emotion and it looks like retaliation. For example, everybody's probably had an, an experience, whether it's at a drive through or whether it's at a restaurant, that you are paying for food and you are paying for service. And the person who is serving you or serving your food to you has an attitude. 
They're rude. Or maybe it's not food, maybe it's somewhere else. Some, you're, you're, you're paying for something and, you're, and, and there's, there's an expectation that comes along with that, but this person has an attitude, they're rude. Typically, human nature is, because this person is being rude to me, my immediate, my short-fused, emotional, fleshly response is to what? Be rude back. It's to be rude back. That's just the way it is, and, and that even happens in our houses, that happens in the church. It happens because that's what our flesh's response is. We, we, we feel like, well, someone is like this to me, that's how I'm supposed to be back to them. So they know they can't be that way to me. Though they know that what they're doing is wrong, or so they realize how it feels. Whatever our, our, our motive or justification is in repaying them the rudeness that they're dishing out to us, uh, we feel justified in doing that because that's what our flesh says. Uh, feels good and is right. But remember, we talked about earlier, we talked about the, in the last study is the easy thing to do is not always the right thing. As a matter of fact, the easy thing to do is typically the fleshly thing and the wrong thing to do. For instance, this is just an example. It's easier to sleep in than to get up, right? Especially you, hey, I, I, I've been working all week, and, and, I, and, I, and I've been working hard, and I just want that extra rest. It's easier to do that in the flesh. It's just easier to give in to that. Um, and so, but the, the discipline, the, the, the heart of the spiritual thing to do is, is to, to be where you're supposed to be or get where you're supposed to get. Um, and so we have to remember, this is the charge that God's given us in his word we are not to repay evil for evil. We are to do what may be the hard thing to do, the spiritual thing to do. Not repay evil. Don't do it. Don't, don't repay what someone has done to you if it's evil. In a similar way, if someone has wronged you in, a, in an undeserved way, they, they, have, they have taken advantage of you, they have wronged you, they, they've hurt you in, in some form or fashion, the truth is this, we have no right, no right at all, and we have no example in our Lord to wrong them back or to take revenge. So remember that. Whenever we feel like somebody has wronged us, we have no right, no matter what we tell ourselves or no matter what we try to convince ourselves to believe, if somebody has done something wrong to us, we have no right to repay them. And again, the example we see in our Lord that we're going to see in a second we have no example in him to repay evil for evil. Again, that's the hard thing to do is not to do that. But remember, the spiritual thing to do is typically the harder thing to do. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, Jesus is teaching and he says, You've heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist, that you don't give in to evil. He says, well, whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn, uh, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Go with thee two. Give to him that asketh thee. And from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You've heard that it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Here's the why that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the son, his Son to rise on the, the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not, even the pub, do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. He says, be therefore complete or perfect or mature, even as your Father in heaven is. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Very clearly, recompense, repay, no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Be sincere. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceable with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to, unto wrath. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head, be not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, let's talk about the motive in this real quick because somebody says, ah, there's my vindication. 
I'm just going to put on a smile and I'm going to be nice to them because now I see if somebody's wrong to me or ugly to me or does something to me and I turn around there, it's just going to, it's going to compile their, the, 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 the negative consequences that they get as I do good to them. No, the motive is not repaying. That's what he says. Don't avenge yourselves. Don't do that. He says this, this is what your job is to do. It's to make sure that you show the love of God regardless of how unloving somebody is to you. And they'll get their judgment. They'll get, they'll, they'll get justice that, that's coming to them. First Peter chapter 2, it says this in verse 19, For this is thankworthy of a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted or corrected for your faults that you should take it patiently? You know if you do something wrong, you get corrected for it, and you take it patiently. How noble or how uh, you know, uh, admirable is that? But if when you do well, when you do right, and you suffer for it, and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Here it is. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, when he was mocked and ridiculed and beaten and, and scourged and, 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 and all this evil done to, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. And finally in 1 Peter chapter 3, it says this in verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be, pit, uh, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, nor railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Don't, don't repay evil, don't repay uh, railing, but give blessing in place of what people give to you as far as evil goes. Knowing that you, that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing for he that will love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Again, one of the hardest but most Christ-like things that we can do is to show love, is to, is to give good when someone has given us bad. Furthermore, one of the most Christ-like things that we can do is to truly and sincerely forgive someone when they've done something wrong to us. One of the most Christ-like, I, I really want to be more like the Lord than, than, than learn to forgive in all sincerity. As Christ hung on the tree, he looked at those who had just mocked him, who had just spit on his face, who had just pulled out his beard, who had just placed a crown of thorns on him and beat him with a cat of nine tails and, and, and put a robe on him and... and and again, mocked him, all, all those things, hung him on a tree to die. And he looked down and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't say, boy, you're going to get what's coming to you. I'm going to get off this cross and get out of that grave, and you're going to pay one day. He didn't say that. He had forgiveness. He asked for forgiveness for their sins to be forgiven, the evil they had done. And I want us to get this tonight because this applies in the home first. Or should apply in the home first. You know, in a lot of homes, a lot of marriages are struggle because things are held on to. And sincere forgiveness isn't given. A lot of churches struggle because of that. A lot of relationships struggle because of that. A lot of people miss out on a lot of things as Christians because there isn't sincere forgiveness given. So it should apply in the, the home first. And I would say with the most intimate relationship that God has given to us, the husband and wife, it should be manifested there clearly. It should be seen among brothers and sisters and sisters and sisters, brothers and brothers. It should be seen in the church very vividly. 
Because if those of us who have been forgiven of all can't forgive all, then what does that say about our hearts? Are they truly changed? Do we truly understand what we, or have we forgotten? If we can't forgive as we've been forgiven, what does that say? Because that's the charge that we find in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4 says this in verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. Listen to what he says, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, making every effort eagerly to keep the, the unity of the Spirit. And the glue that helps that is, is the peace that comes from God. Further in the chapter, it says in verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Listen to what he says. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That all of that junk should be out of our lives as children of God. And then he says, be you kind one to another, tenderhearted. Here it is. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, who hung on a tree, has forgiven you. So again, if, if Christ was patient, is patient with us, and if he forgave us and still forgives us even on a daily basis, and if our Lord didn't repay evil in the face of evil, then we have to take this charge tonight and understand that point number one is this. We have no right to repay evil with evil. Whatever, whatever that looks like, again, um, uh, somebody uh, cutting you off after they were in the wrong lane, and we have no right to repay evil for evil. If somebody's being rude to you, somebody's done something ugly to you, and, I, and, and, and some people struggle with this because, you know, Jesus' uh, statement, if somebody smites you on your cheek, you know, left cheek, turn to, to the other one and, and let them do that. And some people struggle because they say, well, I, I'm just worried about somebody, you know, taking advantage or, or somebody uh, not realizing and, and, and is, it, is it hurting them more than, more than helping them if I don't say something or if I don't do something. Uh, it's never okay to repay evil with evil. And that's, that's what scripture says. It's never okay. If somebody's rude to you, there's never an allowance in scripture that makes it okay for us to be rude back to them. If somebody is ugly to us, we never have a right to be ugly back to them. And again, that can be difficult. Uh, you can see it again in homes. You can see it uh, in the church. And, and people find justification in it because... Well, they did it to me first, just like, just like kids. And it's not, it's not acceptable to the Lord. As much as we feel justified in doing it, the truth is this. We're all sinners, and as sinners, we have no right to exercise revenge on another sinner. No right. It's only the holy God of creation who's made it clear that he will judge and that he will execute a righteous judgment and his judgment will be absolutely just who has the right to repay evil. So let's remember this. Not only is it going to please God, but it's going to help us grow in our, our righteousness and our likeness to the image of Christ. And so the next charge is this, is verse 16, is rejoice evermore. Right off the bat, point number two is this. We have every reason to rejoice evermore. We have every reason to rejoice evermore. The most joyful people on earth should be us, the people of God. We should be the most joyful people. And it's not, be, it's not because our, our teams are doing good or because there's money in the bank or uh, our health is wonderful. We'll talk about that in just a second. The most joyful people, the most enjoyable people to be around on this earth should be the people of God. That's the truth. We should be a joy to be around. It doesn't mean that every single one of us is going to be 
extroverts or comedians or the life of the party and everybody wants to be around us or, or whatever our personality type is like. It doesn't mean that. It means that as the people of God, we have the Holy Spirit of God and we have the joy and we should be rejoicing. And that is contagious. That joy is contagious to a world that has no hope and is in darkness. We should, we should be the most joyful people on this earth. But I would go further to say, we should also be the happiest people on this earth. See, joy comes from God, but it's also a choice that we have to make, to be joyful, to rejoice. That's a choice. It comes from God, and we can, we can choose to be that and do that because it's not based off of circumstance. It's, it's based off of our choice of enacting what God's already given to us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He's given to us that joy. And so it's a choice to activate it. Happiness, though, is affected by circumstances. But it's also a choice. The Bible says that there are those who are supremely happy. And the word that the Bible uses is blessed. I want to look at this uh, in, in Matthew chapter 5. It's those who by their choosing, when they go through various struggles, they go through different afflictions, but they're, it's by their choosing that they determine to do things God's way, to remain who God has called them to be. It's those people who reap that supreme happiness regardless of their circumstance. And I don't know about you, but that's the life that I want to live. I, I want to be joyful. I, I, I want to no matter what my circumstances are, I want to have the joy of God abiding in me, and I want to rejoice in God regardless of my circumstance. And then also, I, I want to be happy, happy, supremely happy in this life, which is also dependent on circumstances, but also governed by a choice that we make. In Matthew chapter 5, is this perfect example, in verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Again, this means supremely happy, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, or the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are they which are persecuted. It's interesting. Again, all these others were, were characteristics, and now this is something that is a circumstantial. It says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it goes on to say, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And the charge goes on to say, Rejoice, in verse 12, and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets which were before you. See, these people are happy. And those who are persecuted for Christ's sake, the Bible says, should rejoice in that. Rejoice that we are counted worthy to suffer for our Lord. We see in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, this is difficult because, as someone pointed out, sometimes uh, trials and pressures and afflictions in this life come along, and, and it can seem impossible to be happy. And I, I want us to understand that there are times that we are going to be sad. There are times that we are going to be hurt. Uh, we saw Miss um, JJ's family today hurting. They were, they were sad. They were mourning. And, and that's, that's okay. Those are normal human emotions. But they can still have joy, and they can ex still, still experience that supreme happiness in the midst of that. As the Bible says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We can still experience this amazing joy and even happiness regardless of our circumstances. But it comes from the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul was making a very clear charge to, to rejoice 
in the Lord. He wasn't say, saying you need to be happy in the Lord. He said you need to rejoice in the Lord. Two times he said this in this verse. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. How can we do that? How can we rejoice in God regardless of how bad our circumstances is, regardless of the, the measure, the gauge of the happiness that we're feeling in the, in the circumstances? How can we rejoice in the Lord always? Because Christ is the one. He is the one in whom the sphere of rejoicing is to take place, to rejoice in him. There's going to be circumstances that don't produce happiness in us, that we don't, that don't, that we don't like, that we don't enjoy. Again, they bring about the sadness. They bring about the hurt. They, there are going to be circumstances that bring those thing about, things about in our life. But we can always rejoice in the Lord. We can always delight in him. And we don't have to look any further than the Apostle Paul as he's writing this to the, to the Philippian uh, church. He was sitting in a Roman prison. And he's telling them from a Roman prison cell to rejoice in God regardless of your circumstances. Great example is this man had this abiding inner joy. He felt supremely blessed. Yet we know at times that he said to the Corinthians that he, they, they, they feared unto death. That they, they felt like their life was in jeopardy. He was stoned. I can't imagine that as those stones hit up against his head and, and his back and, and those sensitive places of his body that he was laughing about it. I can't, I, there, there's nothing in scripture that tells us that he was doing that. I can't imagine that when everybody left him and deserted him, and people that he was relying on that, he just laughed it off. But I do believe that Paul had this abiding joy in his life regardless of what was happening around him, regardless of what he was going through. And it was based off of the relationship he had with the Lord and a choice he was making to rejoice in the Lord. And so tonight, I, I want to encourage us, and as the musicians make their way, I want to make sure that we remember these things. The first point, we have no right to repay evil for evil. So maybe you've already experienced something like that this week, and you feel like, I, I want... I felt justified in doing this. Remember, we have no right as sinners to repay evil to another sinner. We have no right to repay. Now listen, let me, Lord, just impress my heart with this too. Sometimes the evil doesn't look like an action that, or an act that we do. Sometimes it's withholding. Somebody is not doing this to me or for me, and so I will not do this for them. Evil can be both in things that we do and things that we don't do. It's the intent of the heart. But this person hasn't said hi to me in two weeks. I'm not saying hi to them. This person hasn't shook my hand. This person hasn't they called me, this person hasn't texted me, this person hasn't emailed me. I'm surely not going to do that to them. We have no right to repay evil with evil. And sometimes those things aren't even intentional. The things that we, we feel justified in doing or not doing back to somebody else, the other side wasn't intentional in doing it. It's about the heart. It's about making sure that our heart's right. And then number two, we have every reason to rejoice evermore uh, I know in our church, we've got a lot of people going through a lot of circumstances, um, and it, many, many of us are dealing with things every single day, but I, I want to encourage us and charge us to rejoice in the Lord. Again, if, if you're not striving uh, to, to do this, it should be something tonight you say, God, everything around me seems dark and, and bad, but I have a relationship with you, and I don't deserve it. I have eternal life that I couldn't earn. I, I, have, I have so many blessings, and, and, and I want to rejoice in you always, regardless of my circumstance. I want to be one of those people that are joyful to be around because I have your joy inside of me. 
And so I want to encourage you and charge you with that tonight. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. And thank you for these reminders, God. Sometimes it's hard in, in the heat of the moment whenever someone does something to us or they don't do something we expect or assume or um, desire. Lord, just to repay that in, in the flesh. And I pray we would see tonight that there's over and over and over in Scripture you tell us not to repay evil for evil. And we're not to exact judgment in that way, Lord. We are to uh, be your children and follow in your footsteps uh, in the fact that you did good when evil was done to you. And so God, help us to be like you in that. Help us to forgive as we've been forgiven. Help us to love as we've been loved. And uh, help us follow after that. And help us to be uh, ever rejoicing, God. Uh, we have every reason to be rejoicing all the time. And so, Lord, I pray that we would take heed to that tonight. I pray you just move now, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand tonight as they sing, I encourage you to come. Thank you so much again for being here uh, this evening. 
I uh, want to ask you to continue to pray for a couple of things. Uh, continue to pray for Miss JJ and her family, and also for Brother Reuben um, and his recovery uh, from his double lung transplant. Praise the Lord. That was awesome answered prayer, and uh, amen. Praise God. And so continue to keep him and his family in prayer. I know that they appreciate that. And uh, lastly, don't forget tomorrow night, outreach, um, as long as the weather cooperates, and uh, then we'll have it. So be, be attentive to uh, all the forms of communication, email, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, we'll make sure and, and get that out if there's a problem with that. Um, I do want to say, uh, we sent something out this week on, uh, about the, the chairs. Uh, our school normally uh, handles this, but we... Uh, have a different situation this year with uh, our older boys and older kids. Uh, they aren't here whenever uh, we need some, uh, some help. And so if there's any guys or even ladies uh, that can move some chairs and, and, and want to help, uh, then we, we need, there, there are some dates that we put out there, and we need that help on Saturday mornings. And we can, uh, if you'll just respond to that email or talk to Miss Kelly or, or Miss Ashley or myself, and uh, you can say, hey, I can help, but I can only help on these days, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we just need to have, have a good idea of what we're going to be able to do. Um, and on that note, um, if there's a few guys that can help, um, we put out more chairs on Sunday. Uh, but I think that uh, we had people out and sick and, and all that kind of stuff, and we didn't need them. Uh, and we're not, we're not going to need them, I don't think, this next week. Maybe that's lack of faith on my part, but uh, we want to put uh, some of these chairs up. So if you can help after service a little bit, uh, we need to take that back row, those, the back row uh, where Brother Mike and Brother Turner, the backsliders are. And uh, no, <laughs> Brother Mike, no, <laughs> Brother Gary. Uh, and uh, the other sinners back there, but um, no, I'm just playing. I'm the chiefest. Um, but that, and then also there's uh, outside rows of the middle uh, section. So if you can help with that, that'd be great. If not, I'll do it, so it's no problem. Um, and um, I think that's it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to... Uh, be here again to worship you. Thank you for the reminders to, um, to hold fast to your example, Lord, to not repay evil for evil, and to be people that are full of joy uh, because of the joy that you've put in us. Lord, we know that the circumstances in this life don't define our life. Uh, we realize that we have an eternity with you ahead uh, that is true life. And so, God, I pray that we would abide in your joy, that we would choose to rejoice in you, uh, regardless of what's going on in our life. And again, we would be the examples not only in uh, this world, but also to each other and in our homes uh, that you desire for us to be. God, help us to glorify you um, and help us in these things. We'll praise you for it. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.